Hi, this is the first of a two-part presentation on the fundamental topic of mobility. This lecture is based on your Craven and Hernley textbook from 2017, Chapter 25. Mobility is defined as the ability to move freely within the environment, according to your textbook. And it really is a very fundamental part of how we function as people. It's very closely linked to a sense of independence and general health. When we talk about how, our, how we're feeling about um, our health and things like that, we use terms like, well, I'm up, on, up and about, or I'm flat on my back. Um, just different descriptors that really tag the concept of mobility very much to how we think about our health in general. One important thing to think about when we're talking about the concept of mobility is that it is on a continuum. So it's not an on and off thing. We're not just either mobile or immobile. But we have at one end of the continuum full mobility and the other end complete immobility. And we can be anywhere on that continuum in between. Also, when we're talking about mobility, we can be talking about our complete body or we can be talking about a part of our body. Uh, we could have maybe a single limb that is immobilized. Maybe someone's fractured their arm and they're in a cast and they've, that part of their body is immobile even though they're still able to get up and ambulate and walk around and, and, um, and be active in other ways. Or perhaps you have experienced or been around somebody who's experienced, say, Bell's palsy where they have a partial um, immobility of part of their face that affects their speech, chewing and swallowing their nonverbal communication, their self-image, and things like that. But that would be a part of the body. And in other cases, we're talking about the complete body. We also can have uh, different timelines related to mobility. Sometimes it's temporary, like the example of a cast, or even Bell's palsy, which tends to, to um, resolve. Um, sometimes it's progressive. There's a lot of neuromuscular diseases that you've probably studied already in pathophysiology that are progressive. Uh, in terms of the impact on mobility. And sometimes um, the immobility is permanent, such as in the case of stroke or some sort of neurologic trauma. Normal mobility is really dependent on a couple of different things. And one is a functional musculoskeletal system. So structurally, this includes the bones that provide framework, our skeletal muscles that allow for movement, the synovial joints where those bones articulate, um, tendons which connect our muscles to our bones, ligaments which connect our bones to bones. So all of those are important. It's also important that they be in the correct alignment or posture. So good alignment means that there's no unusual stress on the joints and muscles. So this requires not only an intact musculoskeletal system, but also requires an awareness of one's center of gravity. So issues with mobility are not limited to conditions that involve the musculoskeletal system. Another major player would be our neurologic system. And in particular, we have some structures that play important roles in our balance and in coordination of movement. And those would primarily be the reticular formation, the vestibular apparatus in the inner ear, and the cerebellum. When we think about the characteristics of normal movement, one of the things that we recognize is the importance of range of motion. That normal movement requires full range of motion where joints can move through the various planes um, that they are designed to move through. Joints need to be kept actively moving in order to maintain mobility. Um, and there's actually some great uh, a box 25-1 and a table 25-1 in your book that remind you of some of these things that you've probably studied um, in other places, um, but just being comfortable with the language when we talk about different range of motion of joints, flexion and extension, and even hyperextension, abduction or moving away, adduction, moving towards the middle of the body, rotation, whether that's internal rotation or external rotation, supination, going face up or pronation, 
going face down, all different terms that you want to make sure that you're comfortable with when we're talking about normal movement in terms of full range of motion. Another important aspect of mobility is ambulation or walking. Walking is actually a fairly complex activity. It requires the coordination of, of a lot of muscles. We need equilibrium, balance, proper posture, all of those things to, um, to walk. Um, if you've been around a toddler recently and watching them just learn to walk, you, um, you get a sense of all the work that happens as um, a young baby learns how to coordinate all the different muscles that are involved in walking. So when we look at how somebody walks, we refer to that as their gait. And the normal gait has two phases in it, a stance phase that includes a heel strike, mid stance and push off, and then an overlapping swing phase with the acceleration, swing through, and deceleration. Um, I've actually posted a, a short YouTube video for you to watch, and I'd suggest that you watch that after you view this particular um, PowerPoint. Um, that is someone explaining and demonstrating some of the different types of gates, and we'll talk about some of those words in just a few minutes. So when we think about different factors that affect mobility, there are many. Um, and I've listed just some of them here. Your book describes these as well for you. Um, one of the factors that affects mobility is the need for regular exercise. Definitely, if we don't use our muscles, they will begin to atrophy. The use it or lose it principle. Proper nutritional status is important um, as a factor that will affect our mobility. We mentioned before having an intact musculoskeletal system, free from injury, no bone diseases or fractures, no arthritis. Um, those sort of issues. Proper innervation. Obviously we need our brain to be talking through our spinal cords to our spinal nerves and then out to our periphery. Um, circulation and oxygenation will affect mobility. Different congenital problems can impact mobility. Even affective disorders, things like depression. So certainly depression has a negative impact on mobility as you think of people who are depressed and tend to just be sitting. Um, there's also therapeutic restrictions that affect mobility. Um, that can be generalized, such as perhaps a, a woman who's pregnant and is having some bleeding, and so she's put on bed rest for that time. So that is a therapeutic restriction. Obviously, it's for therapeutic reasons, but it does definitely affect mobility um, in a generalized way. Or a therapeutic restriction like a cast, um, as we mentioned earlier, that will, will um, restrict movement or mobility in just one part of the body. So what happens to us when our mobility is altered? What are some of the manifestations we see of altered mobility? One of those things is definitely decreased muscle strength. As we mentioned in the last slide, that disuse atrophy that occurs when we are not using our muscles and they begin to decrease in size. We see changes in muscle tone. That can happen in either direction. We may see hypotonicity or a flaccid um, change in muscle tone, but in, in other circumstances, depending on the innervation, we may also see spasticity. So we can see changes in muscle tone with altered mobility in either direction. We can see a lack of coordination as a manifestation of altered mobility. This is often due to trauma or disease that affects the cerebellum. It can also be caused by alcohol and some other drugs. And some, some words, I just have a, a little um, glossary over there on the right of some words that you want to know. Um, and some of the words that are, that are associated with a lack of coordination would be ataxia, a tremor, or the term chorea, something that's more um, strongly associated with a particular disorder, Huntington's disease. Another manifestation of altered mobility is altered gait. And I've listed, again over on the right, some different descriptors of types of gates. Ataxic gait, a spastic gait, a waddling gait, a hemiplegic gait, and a festinating gait are just some examples. And you will see these described and demonstrated in the, the um, YouTube video that I linked and left on our course website. Another manifestation of altered mobility is falls. All of the above problems will contribute to an increase 
full risk. We also see decreased joint flexibility that occurs in immobilized joints. The muscles actually shorten and fibrotic changes lead to decreased mobility. Um, pain on movement. Pain on movement w is both a cause and an effect of altered mobility. If when you move it, it causes you to feel pain, then naturally we're not going to want to move. And if we don't move, then it's going to cause fibrotic changes that are then going to increase the pain. So we're going to move less, so we're going to hurt more and move less. And you can see that it's rather a vicious cycle. Another manifestation of altered mobility is activity intolerance. And this is often associated with a decreased oxygen supply to muscles, but can also be used to describe a lack of psychological energy to complete an activity. So I'm going to encourage you now to um, take a look at the YouTube video and some of the different gates, and then come back for part two of immobility.